the, the, the story I want to tell really is a, is a collection of learnings that I've had over this period of time from some amazing people and even more amazing companies. Uh, and in my quest to develop what's turned out to be a fascination for me now, uh, I started this mania for brands and branding and the theory of brands and branding uh, many, many years ago when it, it was still being regarded as somewhat flaky and largely irrelevant and very for the soft-minded. Uh, and of course, what's happened since then is I think as we all now recognize, each one of us is a brand or at least a mini brand in the making uh, and most companies appreciate the value of brands and branding. So it seemed to me to be sensible to try and put together in a basket all of the learnings from, as I say, these amazing people uh, and put it together in a book and in turn condense it in front of you. And I make no apology whatsoever for how simple and basic the rules are. I think the benefit of time and experience means that as you come round the block, uh, instead of making things more and more complex and trying to look clever with it, actually the skill is in trying to simplify it. So I've called it the nine and a half golden rules of branding and I'd like you to come with me back to 1979, somewhat embarrassingly. Uh, I was a 19-year-old callow youth, uh, even more full of myself then than I am now, uh, and I just started a career in the advertising business. And that first job was at a rather large, or very dull, large American agency called Lintas, who were famous for providing good training and they had big, important clients. And one of the clients that I was assigned to was bird's eye frozen peas. Uh, now, in those days, of course, as fast-moving consumer goods in the advertising business, those were the prized accounts because they were the big spenders. Uh, and there I was, age 19, much more taken with the glamour and the excitement of being in what my father considered to be a naughty business, uh, but a slightly vacant head. And wandering down the corridor of that agency one day, I strolled into the planning director, the then planning director's office, to find on his desk a large tome-like manual entitled The Psychology of Frozen Peas. And as this callow 19-year-old youth still struggling to come to terms with the psychology of people, this was too fascinating, so I grabbed it and started to have a quick read. And what it turned out, in effect, was a defense document that the agency was preparing for the bird's eye client in the advance of what was then newly being called own label. And back in those days, own label was a new phenomenon and a very threatening one for the brands. And the story in this document went something along the lines of mothers in the South in particular are very careful what they feed their precious young. Uh, they couldn't care less about their husbands, interestingly, but for the children, it was terribly important. It was slightly different in the North, much better values as far as I was concerned, where the bloke still mattered. But in the South, where brand heartland and premium was important, uh, th this idea that uh, mothers might feed their young second-rate or inferior peas uh, was the very thing that Bird's Eye were trading on. And so this document was this argument about how they could build the defense against the own label uh, by pressing all the points, picked and frozen in two and a half hours, and all the other things that the great bird's eye peas were. And that led me to the first lesson of these uh, nine and a half rules, which is a brand isn't just a nice to have, it really is a genuinely powerful, mission critical, competitive weapon. Now, in 2012, when one looks at that and says, well, yeah, kind of, how revolutionary is that? You would be astonished, I think, the number of companies I go into who haven't yet figured out that a brand is a genuinely powerful competitive weapon. Uh, they, many of them still think it's a bit of a nice to have, and the manifestation of that is that they bung it over to the marketing department to worry about. Mistake number one, but believe me, it's a mistake that's rife. I see it all the time. I got reasonably bored quite quickly at Lintas because they were very proper 
and I felt that I'd done my training, at least in terms of how to set up meetings and all that kind of stuff, and wanted a bit more excitement and a bit more creativity in my life. So I moved, and I went to an agency then called Doyle Dane Burnback, which is still in existence as DDB, although it's transmogrified into other things. Uh, it was the home of the great John Burnback. For any of you who know the advertising industry, he's possibly one of the very greatest uh, stalwarts and names. But he, amongst many things, gave to the world some great sayings like, a principle isn't a principle until it costs you money, um, which I find myself saying very often. Uh, or nothing kills a bad idea quicker than good publicity. Uh, fantastic guy, great agency, uh, and I went there to work on, from bird's eye peas to Heinz tomato ketchup, another great iconic thing. Uh, sadly, that my time there was very miserable. Uh, I, I, it was a mistake career move. Uh, I didn't get on with anyone particularly. I was hired by Philip Gould, later to become Lord Gould, who I think in truth was a bit of a fish out of water there and was looking for a kindred spirit, and in me he saw one. Uh, he left not that long after I got there, uh, and so I was left flapping around on my own somewhat. Uh, Heinz one day came to us and said, we're thinking of turning the ketchup bottle into a squeezy bottle. Well, there was absolute consternation in Baker Street where the agency was because we'd spent many years and tens of millions of pounds running commercials on how the Heinz ketchup was the slow one. And we'd had lorry drivers and grannies and kids all bashing the bottom of the bottle based on that Guinness thing about good things come to those who wait. And I'm sure many of you have seen those commercials. And so this outcry went up. It said, you can't possibly put this ketchup in a squeezy bottle. You'll kill everything that we've been doing for many years. The whole brand will go up in smoke. And you'll have wasted the many tens and tens of millions. Well, of course, they went straight ahead and did it. And of course, it became a roaring success. And that gave me the second learning about brands, which is to build a brand, make sure you know the real proposition. It probably isn't what you think it is. There we were, a whole sophisticated agency, arguing fiercely for how they couldn't innovate with their product because ultimately it would ruin the commercials that we'd made about bashing the bottom of bottles. Uh, but, but the simple fact is, of course, that ketchup was always about meal enhancement. Slow was just one delivery method, and here was a new delivery method. And there was a great learning for me, actually, that the proposition may well be lurking somewhere else. And in years to come, I worked with a company called Vax, who make vacuum cleaners. And I'm going to see if I can get through this passage without mentioning Hoover, because it's impossible to talk about hoovering without mentioning hoovering. Uh, but they, their stock in trade was very powerful engines. And they were all about cleaning floors and carpets, deep cleaning floors and carpets, believing that that was the proposition. Our research told us, actually, that most people weren't really that bothered with deep clean. What they wanted was fast clean. And very suddenly, the powerful engines became a support for fast clean rather than deep clean. And we moved them from cleaning floors to brightening homes. Completely different place, much bigger place. They could then launch all their uh, uh, mineral, their, their uh, liquids behind it. It completely opened up their franchise. Again, what seemed like the obvious proposition, which was the engines, actually was something else. It was about brightening homes. The same was true for home base. They came to us and they said, well, we're a DIY shed, can't distinguish from anybody else. And when we examined their research and discovered that actually they had a higher incidence of couples going shopping at, uh, at home base than the other hairy ass ones like B and Q or the others, we very quickly moved them from a DIY shed to a homemaking shop and thus make a house a home, which they're still running now. So the proposition isn't always the obvious thing it might be. And that was a fascinating learning for me about how to think more naturally. 
As I said, I wasn't very happy with, their, uh, with being there. It was compounded by the fact that my mother suddenly contracted cancer. She was on her way out, and the whole period that I was there was like one long, dark winter. And I felt again that it was time for a change. And so I jumped and I joined a new agency called Low Howard Spink. Frank Low, now Sir Frank, was one of the original enfants terribles of the industry, uh, mad as a hatter, uh, but brilliant and dangerous to know. Very, very exciting guy. Fantastic offices in Knightsbridge, uh, cool as anything. I'd reached Nirvana. Uh, there were 24 of us when I joined, and the place was absolutely rocking. And I was assigned to the GM, or the Vauxhall Cars account. And after a while, a debate ensued between us and them as to how it was that consumers were buying cars. Now, I think it's probably true for most of us that one says, I drive a Mercedes, and it happens to be an E-Class, and it happens to be the 280, and it happens to be black. And, and that's, that's the sort of cascading order of how people think about and, in turn, buy cars. Vauxhall, though, because of the way they were structured, had the Astra bit and the Cavalier bit and the absolutely awful Belmont bit, which thankfully has been taken out of circulation, and the other bits that they had. And their entire uh, structure for talking to the universe was, was based on how they were organized and built internally. And the debate started when we said to them, we don't think people buy Cavaliers or Astras or, God forbid, Belmonts. We think they buy Vauxhalls first and then do the Cascade. And after much toing and froing, they resisted it, but eventually uh, the penny dropped and they bought the argument, and so ensued a Vauxhall, once driven, forever smitten, which was a way of putting together the whole of the Vauxhall story. But that led me to this uh, third very important point. The company structure doesn't define the brand, but the brand can, and in my view, should define the company structure. We, I think, help them see that they should restructure themselves around the way in which people bought their cars, not structure themselves in the way they make them. Uh, very, very important uh, lesson, one that uh, now, years on, I'm doing more and more of this kind of work, uh, and I'm just closing uh, 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 an enormous piece of work with a very large PLC who had bought three other businesses, two of which were nearly as big as they are, and one of the first things they've done is an exercise of this nature to define what is it then that could hold the whole thing together before they, build, they start building the structure of all four businesses. So it's become a four-way merger, which for me is a first. I mean, normally two-way mergers are problematic enough. A four-way one is double the complexity, but it's based on this very thought that we need a proposition in the middle before we can then really properly structure uh, the business. That time at Low House Bink was great. Uh, I'd served my time, I think. Uh, we'd grown from 23 people to 130 people. Tim Bell, now Lord Bell, had joined. Uh, it was fab, but again for me, uh, it was time to move on. And that was uh, uh, exacerbated by the fact that I'd received a telephone call from the ex-creative director at Low House Bink who'd gone to... WCRS, and he was trying to build a team of people at that agency. And he called me one evening, and I went over and had a, what I thought was an innocent drink with him, until he dropped what became a bombshell for me and said, would I come and join them and run this account? Well, in the late 80s, of course, this was beyond the ultimate driving machine, was really the ultimate branding machine, and for anyone remotely concerned with good advertising, or better still, with great branding, there was no higher peak. Uh, and I remember leaving that office in Covent Garden that evening, absolutely skipping on air. I knew something significant had happened to me because being asked to go and work in such exalted company was something, frankly, more than I ever deserved. 
in I went and started to get to grips with BMW. What a fantastic company, what a fantastic brand, what great people they were. Uh, they're every bit as good as you might think they are. And one of the things they were doing in, in that time was, was sponsoring the touring car championship, their, their, their racing cars around a circuit. And they'd picked up this deal at a bargain price. And it was at a time when not that many people were watching that kind of thing on television. And the inevitable that happens only to BMW, everything they touch turns to gold, the inevitable happened. Suddenly, TV audiences went through the roof. And not surprisingly, they started winning race after race after race after race. And one Monday morning, enthused by this, I went in and we had a meeting with the managing director, Tom Purvis, and I bowled up to him, puppy dog-like, saying, God, it's fantastic, isn't it, Tom? We're just winning everything, isn't it brilliant? And he stopped and said, well, actually, I'm quite alarmed. Oh, why, why might that be? And he said, well, the competition for these things is getting more and more fierce. And as it gets more and more fierce, the drivers are pushing the cars harder and harder. And they're now banging into each other and bits are flying off. It's becoming like stock car racing. And I don't think that's doing our brand any good. We don't need this. We don't need the publicity. We can win in our own way. I was astonished at that, uh, this innate very diligent sense of how meticulously you have to manage your brand. Not all good publicity, not all publicity is good publicity. Here was the man who, when we would drive around, would want to remove old second-hand BMWs from the street because it tarnished the brand. And here he was saying, we don't need this. We don't need the support of the media. We don't need, we will just win in our own way. And this, this branding is win about winning in your own way actually has formed the bedrock for everything that I believe in, practice, advise, and espouse now, that it really is about getting to understand oneself and then winning according to your own uh, terms, rules, and, and conditions. Uh, and it's for them uh, I'll be eternally grateful. They also taught me, though, that at the heart of every powerful brand in the world is an outstanding product. And I believe there's a very real danger in this open and transparent world where everyone wants to be a brand and it seems relatively easy to become a brand because the chan media channels are so open to us. This is a fundamental learning that, that people uh, uh, run the risk of. At the heart of every powerful brand is an outstanding product. If you, if you can't get the product right, you ain't got a chance. And they were great at that. During that time at uh, WCRS, we pitched for uh, the BT account, and we won it. Actually, it was the business part, their business to business part. And what ensued for me was a very good relationship with the then director of communications at BT, Adrian Hosford, a fantastic bloke, uh, complete maverick, uh, Irish, glint in the eye, great uh, rule breaker, perfect for corporate world because he just frightened everybody. And well into the relationship, one day he rang me up and said, would I come over and have a drink? And I thought dutifully I would, uh, and I did that evening. And he produced a couple of glasses of champagne, as is his wont, and said very bluntly, had I ever considered jumping the client agency fence and going to work for them at BT? And I'm alleged to have said to him two things, Adrian. Firstly, you'd never find me anywhere for me to park my car. And secondly, why would I want to go and work for a company filled with people wearing gray plastic shoes? Uh, he battered away, rightly, the utter facetiousness of the second remark, said, no, no, don't worry about the car, we'll find somebody. But think about it, it really would be good for you to spread your wings and come and learn what life might be like as a buyer rather than a seller. I, inside, could feel that he was probably right, actually, but there was no way I was going to admit that, not least to myself. I'd never worked outside the agency business, never worked outside a company of 150 people, and there, there was one of 250,000 people. And it was just anathema. I couldn't do it. Uh, anyway, off I went that night, rattled 
because a little truth bell inside me was ringing that actually if I wanted to stretch and learn, doing it over there uh, might just be the answer. So of course, the following morning, I rang him up and said, all right then, mate, you're on. I joined BT, uh, glorying in the wonderful title of Worldwide Head of Advertising and Media Quality. It could barely fit on the business card. And a, a 125 million pound budget and realized over the ensuing months just how many friends I had in the industry. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so we started. Uh, uh, BT were going through major change at that time. Uh, th th there was a, a big regulatory change uh, and they needed to re-find and rediscover themselves for a new future. And Adrian had commissioned a piece of work uh, from a, an amazing man called Norman Strauss. Amazing boffin cigar smoking man, uh, mad as a hatter again, uh, who had delivered to the board of BT his view of what it was that they were fundamentally about. And in that delivery, his conclusion was, you're not really the telephone company, you're not really a technology company, you are about reciprocated confidences. Now, that took BT a very, very long time to understand. Uh, it took me a good year of being there uh, to understand it, uh, and it certainly took all the agencies that we worked with even longer to understand it. I remember the planning director at Saatchi is referring to it as reciprocated trousers, uh, which was her polite way of saying, it's all a load of bollocks, isn't it? But actually, one day the penny dropped about what is reciprocated confidences. And it dropped when Adrian realized that he hadn't got his top team together around this notion well enough. He took us all away to Bath Spa. And we spent three or four days together as a team talking to each other and doing what turned out to be, in the end, reciprocating of confidences. And the moment where it struck me was when we were walking across the lawn and he was telling me that he was one of seven children, he was largely brought up by his sisters, uh, and that that had affected his relationship very positively with women and such and such. And then it was my turn. Uh, and I started uh, unbridled, flowing with, well, born in Brazil, Italian mother, uh, English father, horror of boarding school, live like an outsider in this country, enjoy being an outsider. And the penny dropped at that moment that what had happened was he had revealed some confidences and I in turn was reciprocating with confidences of my own. And that was a, a eureka moment because it redefined what communications is. It's the exchange between people of things particularly of value. And that was such a fundamentally important finding for the phone company that it, it led them to rebuild the entire business from 250,000 people around this notion. And so was born It's Good to Talk, which is a much more user-friendly version of reciprocated confidence. And it's Good to Talk over a five-year period generated for them five billion pounds worth of incremental revenue. It also led to the Stephen Hawking commercial, which some of you might remember, 15 years on, still an amazing piece of work that Saatchi's did, uh, that uh, is, is, was sent to Blair's camp for the Northern Irish peace talks uh, and became a piece of social commentary, the only claim of which was BT is helping to keep the world talking. It's a fantastic uh, piece of thinking that led me to this, was that all good communication is based on understanding reciprocation of confidences. If you want to have good communications, you first have to climb into an understanding of how I'm going to give some of myself in order that I get something from you. But it wasn't just about communications there. Adrian was like a man possessed, and he took this notion through the business, and the van drivers were retrained. that You're not just there to fix uh, wiring, you're there to enable people to keep communicating. And the same was true for the uh, telephonists. And the sixth lesson that came from him was that great brands need great humans to champion them. Uh, I now, when I start projects with clients, 
immediately try and find who is going to be the champion. It doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO. It can be anyone with the will and the spirit and the drive and determination to take the thinking through and into the business. I then started my own agency after BT time, trying to do more of this, really. I wanted to do reciprocated confidences and do Hawkings and Good to Talks. Uh, if I'm kind to myself, I'd say I was ahead of my time. If I'm honest, I, I balls it up because, of course, clients don't buy it like that. So quite quickly in that tenure, it, that business ran 12 years, but quite quickly I realized that w my center of gravity was pulling more and more towards the brand thinking part. But there was one early example uh, when we were still in uh, rented offices in the first month of the company's existence a fairly intelligible fax came through. W what looked to us like somebody asking for a print quote, we ignored it. We moved to our proper businesses, and the same fax came through, still apparently asking for a print quote, we ignored it. And then finally, a third one came through with big letters saying, please respond to this fax. And it turned out to be a Danish company called Velux. I defy anyone in this, in this uh, room to not have heard of Velux roof windows. An astonishing thing, uh, we had never touched one, I'd never bought one, and yet somehow everyone knows this odd brand. That was peculiar. And, and what they were after was a critique of their print work. It wasn't a print quote. And they said, we would be competing against a French agency and a German agency for the European prize. So we set about thinking what our response would be, and it was clear from all of their literature that they talked endlessly about the quality of their wood, the quality of their screws, and how well put together, and all the rest of it. When they finally turned up in the office, seven of them, we only had a sofa and a chair, so there were people on edges of things, doing coffee, and it was up three stories of what had been a bordello. Uh, it was awkward. Uh, but they turned up, and we said to them this, Velux isn't about wood, nor about glass, nor about screws. Fundamentally, what you're about is the creative force of turning dark to light. Well, for a European venture, they immediately got that. And to cut a much longer story short, we were awarded the, uh, the account. Uh, a commercial ran in nine countries. They paid us very well, and the business was airborne. But there came with this a sting in the tail in this lesson which was the fact that we and they hadn't prepared their business uh, well enough for the consequences of running advertising. But the big thing about this lesson for me was this, that if you find the human need, even seemingly dull products can be powerfully branded. Take, for example, Maersk, the shipping line. We all know it, have little interaction with it. Blue circle cement. Whoa. Chubb, Eddie Stobart, Onyx Waste Management. There are loads of these sleeping beauties out there that if one can get to the insight of what they're about, can become, and indeed these guys, have become very powerful brands. But the sting in the tail that I mentioned was this. A brand can't run too far ahead of its company. This advertising was very successful for them, but we hadn't done the follow-through, and so there was a, a, a run on product. And of course, when it comes to emotive things like homeware, uh, the company got into a lot of trouble for that. Uh, they were naive, we were young and foolish, mistakes learned all round. Later on in my life, uh, the agency was called Bank. Uh, I was in the Cromwell Road, and I saw a poster for Honda, and it was some nonsense about Swindon. And so cross was I about that, because I always thought Honda were a great company. Uh, I wrote to the managing director. I said, look, I'm not particularly after the advertising account, but really, you've got to do better than this. And he sent me a note saying, come and see me. And I got there, and he said, Mr. Honda died eight years ago. Since he's gone, Honda-ness is evaporating. We need to recapture it and bottle it. Can you do that for me? What a brief, dream brief. I said, yes, of course. He said, okay, well, I'm going to introduce you to Simon Thompson, who was the head of special projects then. Now, I go by an expression which is better to tame a wild horse than flog a dead one. And Simon is as wild as they come. The man knows no boundaries. 
Uh, he's a complete rebel, maverick, and all the rest of it, and one of the most wonderful people you could ever hope to meet. And he said to me, forget all about that. The problem is this. We're seen as sensible, but dull. And can you fix the dull? We don't mind the sensible. So I said, fine. And he said, on top of that, I'm not going to let you do any research, talk to dealers, talk to the media. You're going to come with me, and I'm going to show you what Honda really is. And he took me to the Isle of Man TT races because at the very heart of Honda is motorbikes. We think it's cars, but actually it's bikes. And when you get there to this place, it's a madhouse. And he, he took me onto the starting grid with all these bikes there, revving up, ready to go, very concerned families standing around the riders, uh, all of the petrol heads with black grit and oil under what little fingernails they had left, uh, and an atmosphere of tension, uh, high tension, excitement, and very real danger. And off they went. And we were taken to a corner at the bottom of a long hill where we had to look up to see these silhouetted figures come screaming down the road and turn right. And they were trying to get as close as they possibly could to the curb edge, missing it by centimeters, trying to make it millimeters, knowing that any one clip was certain death. I, mean, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I stood there thinking to myself, dull they ain't. They really ain't. They, and they were the lead guys there. And he told endless stories about how they first got into Formula One racing and all the rest of it. And they're such an extraordinary company that we had to invent new language for how we described them. And it was a combination of having very lofty visions and the engineering wherewithal to make these visions come true. So we referred to them, referred to them as being visioneers, which, of course, they saw and said, that's exactly what we are, and what Mr. Honda, he was a visioneer, and we are about visioneering. And it went off to Japan, and Japan sent it back saying, we like this, do you mean the power of dreams? And I said, well, I would have said powered by dreams, actually. And they said, no, no, we like the power of dreams, and so that's what we're going to do. And I said, well, it's your brand, not mine, and off they went. And the rest was history. But it came again from understanding the absolute truth of what that organization was about. And that was this one, which is about keep searching to find your truth. Everyone has one. And once found, it liberates organizations to be themselves, and it liberates individuals within organizations to be themselves. So, just to get to the penultimate point then, uh, I've let, this is the ninth, the, the ninth and a half, the half isn't because it's only half a point, it's because actually it's never really concluded. Uh, and, it's, and it's as simple as it's about the people. Brands fundamentally are inside out creatures. And again, particularly today where it's all so transparent, what's going on on the inside will very quickly become visible on the outside. Uh, I saw McKinsey produced a video recently where they had the marketing directors of Coke and I think Kellogg and a few others, and they're still talking about consumers will make what they want of your brand. Well, that's partially true and, of course, unarguable with at one level, but I think misses the point completely. Brands are inside-out creatures, and what you do on the inside is what's going to reflect on the outside. So very quickly then, just to change media, I, I wanted to use the um, flip chart if I might. I I'm aware I'm over time, but this will be two minutes and it just finishes, uh, finishes off. Um, to try and condense all of this into one uh, model or a process uh, for what I'm doing now and doing in the future that's all centered on my belief around something called the single organizing principle. Um, great, Th thanks for that. And I'll take that pen, thanks. And it starts with an assertion that every business, yours, mine, and this business, is fundamentally predicated on three things. One is its culture. Who we are, the kinds of people we are, what we celebrate, what we frown upon, when we celebrate. The other is the product or the service. Again, my friends at BMW taught me this. Those products running around out there say more about that company than anything 
else does. And the last one, I've made a mess of my circles, is reputation. How you are seen by the world, whether that's future employees, prospective customers, and that's mostly where the comms function sits. And when I approach, I'll talk about people in a minute, when I approach companies, the first thing I try and do beyond understanding this is to reframe this in a new shape that says, we need to find this bit in the middle, the joystick, this is the glue that draws all of this together. And this is the single organizing principle. And is, I think, the only piece of jargon, so forgive me, but the language is very important. It has to come from the principles of who you are and what you're about. I learned that from Anita Roddick and The Body Shop. We know that from Innocent. If it doesn't come from the truth of what you're, you're about, you're going to get found out. So it must be based in truths. What the advertising business taught me brilliantly was the value of single-minded thinking. It's the single thing that most companies find the hardest thing to do. What's that one thing? Yes, I know that's important and that's important. But what's the one thing that you're going to peg your hat to? And the third part of it is it's an organizing principle, as in providing freedom within a framework. It's not just a bunch of rules and regs. It's we stand for this, we believe in this. Now off you go and exercise that as employees of the business. And over time, what one's trying to do is recreate a company whereby that idea predominates. And because life's like that, there's always going to be a bit of wobbling around the edge. But the ultimate driving machine for BMW was far more than just the ad line. It was the stick and the carrot. It was the carrot that drew people to them, and it was the stick that when they went into a dealer's dealership and the loos were dirty, they would just wave the ultimate driving machine at them, and everyone knew what that meant. It was an organizing principle in practice. We all know these companies here. These are the apples, uh, the innocents, perhaps slightly less so nowadays, the Channel 4s as they were, where you can't put a fag paper between the kinds of people they are, the things they do, and the way they're seen. And this aligning process, which is what re is really all about, means that a business in this shape is financially, aerodynamically much more efficient because it's carrying less drag. And a business in this shape is seeping away pounds or euros or drachmas, as it's soon to be, out into the atmosphere because it is carrying drag. So the, I said the last one was penultimate. This is the penultimate point. The science behind this is that this is about, uh, brands are about alignment, drawing people together in the way that this event and this organization draws like-minded people together. Alignment. And that means the business can be much more efficient because we haven't got drag. We're not arguing about right, wrong. We're arguing better, best. As a result of which, efficiencies leads to profitability. And if that piece of logic is true, ongoing alignment is going to give us sustainable profitability and, of course, sustainability of profit is the direct determinant of shareholder value. So when conversations start, as they do, we can't attract the right people or hang on to them. It's a cultural question. The website's not working as hard as it might do. It's a reputational issue. We can't get products to market fast enough because the Chinese... Sorry, my ear... My argument is that before we are able to answer any one of these things, we have to define what the organizing principle is and then respond to that. And as we heard earlier, this will have a causal effect on this, which will have a causal effect on this, which will have another causal effect. The whole thing is scrunched up together in alignment or should be. The very last point then, after my two penultimates, is what next? I'm fascinated and gripped and convicted by the notion of the single organizing principle. It seems to me to give meaning and purpose to every organization I encounter, uh, but increasingly fascinated about how it could work for individuals. 
And that's going to be the next phase. I've just started developing a product which Capgemini are running through their university for how we can find single organizing principles for their leaders. Uh, and that, if I'm fortunate enough ever to be asked back, uh, might be something I could talk about then. Thank you very much. <laughs>